Open your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Hebrews. I realize that this bit of information is not in your bulletin. So Hebrews chapter 10 is what we're looking at. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, there's an interesting little story uh, in Reader's Digest, a lady's writing, and she says, I was sprawled on the living room couch watching my favorite show on the Food Network when my husband walked in and said, why do you watch these food shows? He asked, you don't even cook. <laughs> Glaring back at him, I asked, then why do you watch football? Of course, the point being that uh, we enjoy being spectators. We enjoy watching, uh, sometimes more than participating. Uh, football, cooking, are probably fall into those categories. We enjoy watching someone make a good meal and then eating it, of course, then uh, making it ourselves. <clears throat> well, I hope to convince you this morning of the fact that Christianity is not a spectator sport. If you think it is, then you're gravely mistaken. So with that as an introduction, let's read Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse 19 and read through verse 25. Therefore, brothers, <clears throat> since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near." Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit who is at work inside of those who claim your name and who are your children. We ask that you would enable us this morning to understand your word clearly. And Lord, we ask that by your spirit, you would help us to put it into practice. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, I feel like to begin with, I have to, uh, I have to explain why I've chosen Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. <clears throat> in some ways, Pastor Dave has it easy. You know that if he's preaching in Luke 15, it's because he was preaching in Luke 14 last week, and he'll be preaching, you know, in Luke 16 next week. But when I stand up here occasionally, you know, you, you could spend as much time choosing a passage as you do preparing uh, to preach the passage. So <clears throat> the genesis uh, for this one really goes back to this past summer, uh, and it came out of uh, a book I was reading called Simple Church, uh, which if you're interested at all, I, I recommend. Um, and the question that really that book revolves around, or at least the one that stuck out to me, is this. How does discipleship happen in your church? How does discipleship happen in your church? And towards the beginning of that book, they are surveying uh, several different churches. And uh, they're, they're talking to one in particular, and they, they note this. When we ask the staff and key lay leaders what the church's process for discipleship is, we get blank stares, confused looks. We rephrase the question several times. How do you structure your church to make disciples? How do you set up your ministry programs to move people towards spiritual transformation? More blank stares, some stuttering. The best response, basically, it just sort of happens, which is priceless. <laughs> basically, it just sort of happens. Um, I suspect you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. If, if that's the answer, then probably what that means is basically it just sort of isn't happening. Uh, we, we hope it is, we think it is, it might be, but we don't know for sure. <clears throat> so when I, when I begin to reflect on that and reflect on that in the context of our church, of our local church, I realized that 
really my answers were not any better than uh, what these church leaders were giving. Uh, surely I could list off a bunch of programs that we do or a bunch of weekly gatherings that we have, but I don't think I could have given a, a very well-reasoned, this is how discipleship happens in our church. Uh, and so that's what sort of prompted in my mind and through further discussions for the past eight or ten months uh, with Pastor Dave and the rest of the staff and the elders, we've been thinking about, okay, what does discipleship look like in our church? How does discipleship happen in our church? Now, of course, let me be clear that we're under no illusion that <clears throat> there's a 12-step plan to maturity or, you know, three steps and you're saved. Uh, Discipleship doesn't work like that. If you could manufacture disciples, then the megachurches would have us all beat, right? Uh, it simply doesn't work like that. But on the other hand, if you don't have some sort of rubric, some sort of outline, some sort of general process through which you're intending to move people toward greater maturity, then it's probably not happening. It, it, it might be happening, but again, almost by accident, right? Not by any intention, not by any <clears throat> overarching theme. And so that's, that's where, if, if you were at the annual meeting, you saw these brochures that we handed out, and you should have got one in your bulletin this morning as well. This is why you do not have an outline for the sermon, because this side is the outline, to know him, to grow in him, to go with him. This is the outline for the sermon this morning. And that is why this morning I am preaching from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. So uh, keep this handy. Uh, I won't refer to it much until the end, uh, but what we're going to be doing is looking at this passage that uh, these various terms are based on. So in short, that is we're going to be looking at three stages of spiritual growth. Three stages of spiritual growth. To know him, to grow in him, and to go with him. Uh, before we jump into the text here, uh, let me just give you a brief background to the book of Hebrews. Um, if you've been in our Sunday school class, then you've got this covered, because we've been studying it for eight months or so. Uh, I told them that this morning, and they didn't seem to agree, but in any, in any case, I think we are getting somewhere. Um, at a high level, there's a lot that we don't know about the book of Hebrews, like who wrote it, who we wrote it to, what the context was. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of information that we don't know for certain. Uh, but having said that, there are several key themes and several key points that we can pull from the text. One of which is the book of Hebrews surely appears to be a sermon, like a written sermon that a pastor would have delivered to this congregation had he been in person. But for whatever reason, he couldn't be there. And so he wrote out his sermon and he sent it to them. That seems, that seems to be the thrust of his argument and his examples throughout the book. So it, it seems like it's a written sermon. And it, it's also pretty clear that the congregation was struggling with a few things. Uh, one in particular is they were struggling with turning away from Christ and turning back to a misunderstanding of the law. And what they were turning back to in particular is the idea that you could be saved by following the law. It's really a misunderstanding of the law because the law was never given to cause salvation. It, it was given to make you see your need for salvation, see your need for a savior, uh, but not, not in the sense that, you know, if you kept this, then you'd be regenerated. That was not the goal of the law. Uh, so that, that's one of the things they're struggling with, is turning back to the law. And part of why they are doing that is because they're facing persecution. Uh, it's clear in at least one passage that they have already endured some persecution. And it also appears that they are being threatened with experiencing some more persecution. And so for them, the easy way out is to turn back to Judaism and to forget about this Messiah business that, that Christianity is all about and just go back to the way things were. <clears throat> so at a high level, that, that's the background for the book of Hebrews. And as we jump into chapter 10, we are really almost at the climax of the author's argumentation. Um, he's, he's arguing all the way through verse or through chapter 10, but when we get to chapter 11, he sort of switches, and as you may 
be aware, the faith chapter, he starts giving a whole bunch of examples of other people from the Old Testament who have been faithful, who have trusted in God's promises and have carried through. So we're really to the climax of our author's argumentation, which is good uh, and it's bad because uh, (laughs) there's a lot we're going to have to skip over, unfortunately. Um, There's a lot that our author is referring to in shorthand, really. He's using phrases that he's already explained. And so we'll pick up on some of those key phrases uh, as best we can. So let's do that starting in verse 19. Therefore, holy brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Okay, let's pause there for a second. And uh, in an effort to help us understand what he's referring to, because this is really the section where he's using a whole bunch of shorthand. So let's turn back to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, I'm going to start reading in verse 24. Uh, But he, that is Christ, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, he's referring to the high priests of the, of the Levitical system, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of, of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever." Continuing in chapter 8, now the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So our confidence, verse 19, our author here, chapter 10, 19, he starts out with this word confidence, right? What is that in? What is that based on? not on what we've done, not on what we think we hope to achieve, but it's based on a sure hope. It's based on the perfect work of Jesus Christ. And back in chapter 7, he's making the argument that Christ is so much better than the Old Testament sacrificial law because he serves, the, the phrase he uses, in the true tent, right? In the actual one in heaven. Uh, later, we just talked about this in Sunday school this morning, but the author of Hebrews is making the case that what God revealed to Moses in the Old Testament was actually based on a heavenly template. It was based on the real deal, the real thing in heaven, the real temple, the real tabernacle. And Christ is so much better because he serves in the real thing, not just an example, not just a copy, uh, which is good. It's not bad. God gave the Israelites that for a purpose. But Christ is so much better because he serves in the real thing. So our confidence when we draw near to God is based on Christ's sure work. It's based on Christ's sure work. And he is, uh, 725 says, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost or completely or at all times those who draw near to God. There's that phrase again. Draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So likewise, we don't, we don't draw near in trepidation or in fear wondering if God is gonna judge us because we know we're not drawing near on the basis of what we've done. We're drawing near on the basis of what Christ has done. And it's already been judged to be found good and to be found perfect, and to be found sufficient for us to draw near. He uses this word curtain in chapter 10, verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is his flesh, which is, uh, which is interesting. Uh, again, he's referring to this uh, Old Testament sacrificial system where you have the, uh, the outer court. If you've seen a model of the temple, you have the outer court, and then you have the holy place inside of that. And then inside of that, you have the holy of holies. 
And the Holy of Holies was separated by a curtain, by a veil, from the holy place. The only time and the only person who went into the Holy of Holies was the high priest one time a year. In the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where God's presence actually dwelled. That's where God literally was on earth for several hundred years, dwelling in the Holy of Holies. But no one drew near with confidence to the Holy of Holies. In fact, what they did was tie a a rope around the high priest who was going in there once a year in case he was struck dead for whatever reason. Sin would be the reason. Uh, and, And if so, they could pull him out. Uh, They entered into God's presence not with boldness, not with confidence, but with fear and trepidation. But if you remember Matthew, Matthew chapter, let me find it here, 27, verses 50 and 51, Christ is hanging on the cross. Verse 50, he yields up his spirit. Verse 51, the curtain was torn in two, symbolizing free, open access to the presence of God. No longer do we have to approach the Holy of Holies with fear and trepidation, but on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, on the basis of Christ's perfect life, that veil has been torn and we have free access. And we can come with boldness, with confidence before the actual presence of God. It is it is it's difficult to understand. It's difficult to believe that that is what we have. But that is exactly what Christ has provided for us. That's exactly what he's done. It's far better than a tentative, I think I'm good enough, or I, I hope I'm good enough. Uh, what we have in Christ is a sure hope. So that brings us to verse 22 here. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Our author explains this a little bit more in chapter 4. I'll read chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not yet, or I'm sorry, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So yet again, from a, from a different angle, our author is telling us we have confidence to draw near, not just because of Christ's perfect sacrifice, but also because of Christ's life and because of Christ's temptations while he was here on earth, he can sympathize with us. So no longer are we drawing near to someone who we presume can't sympathize with us, but we are drawing near to someone who has done the work, accomplished salvation, and knows exactly how we feel. Knows exactly how we feel. So we can draw near to Christ without fear. We can draw near to God through Christ without fear of retribution and knowing that Christ knows exactly how we feel. More than that, it says full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith, right? That full assurance is based on what Christ has done. But it would probably be good to address this little word faith because it, it comes up a lot in the book of Hebrews. And let's just flip over. I don't know where you are now, but Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, right before our author goes into giving all of these examples of Old Testament saints who were faithful and who believed the promises. Right before that, in verse six, he says this. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You see that? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, you can do as many works as you would like and they're useless if, if there's no faith. It's impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to him must believe two things, right? What are the two things? That, that he exists and that he offers a reward, right? Why else would you draw near? <laughs> You're not drawing near if you know punishment is coming, right? 
So faith includes at, at least these, these two components that you, of course, you believe that he exists, right? Otherwise, the whole point is moot. Or, or I'm sorry, and you believe that you're drawing near with boldness and confidence on the basis of what Christ has done, knowing that you will receive a reward, not because of what you've done, because of what Christ has already done for you. So, the, the second part of verse 22 there, uh, we, we draw near with full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Uh, we don't have as much time as I'd like to dive into this particular point, but uh, our author is making a distinction here in a bit of a shorthand way that he has just spent a lot of time arguing about. And that is the distinction between sinfulness and sins, okay? And uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Um, we have a tendency to think that we are sinful because we do bad things. But that's twisting it. It's, it's the other way around. We are sinful people. We are sinful beings, and hence, we do bad things. Okay, so there are, there are two actually separate issues and what our author is arguing in chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9, and 10 here, is that the Old Testament law was really only ever addressed at sins that we did, individual sins, individual problems we had. The, the Mosaic law was never intended to regenerate. It was never intended to address the heart problem of sinfulness. And in fact, it can't. This, again, is another reason why Christ is so much better because Christ can do both, right? That's, that's what he says here at the end of verse 22. Hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. That's his shorthand of saying your sinfulness, your utter, total depravity, it can be gone on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ. And secondarily, our bodies washed with pure water, an, an image of, of baptism, of, of just cleanliness, but also an image indicating the individual sins, those things that we do, they are also accounted for. They're actually, it's a much smaller problem, uh, but they are accounted for in Christ. And this does, <clears throat> this does of course, prompt an, an interesting an interesting definition of hypocrisy, which I think is pretty accurate. Uh, hypocrisy is external conformity without internal renewal. It's external conformity without internal renewal. And hence, that's why Christ is so upset with the Pharisees time and time again, is because they are conforming externally to the law without any sort of internal renewal. And the reality is you and I can do the same thing if we're not careful. <clears throat> But Christ has the ability to change us from the inside out. That's what we're looking for. That's what's required. That's what's needed. That's what regeneration is. That's what salvation is, is a heart change. Cleansing you, your heart from the inside out. That's authentic spirituality. That's authentic Christianity. This process of drawing near to God, it's enabled by the Holy Spirit, and predominantly he uses his word and his people. And that's point two, to grow in him. First point is to know him. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Second point, to grow in him. This begins in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And verse 25 not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now you'll notice uh, if you're looking at verses 22, 23, and 24, they all begin with let us, right? Let us draw near, let us hold fast, and the third one, let us consider. So from the outset, our author is, is, is not suggesting that any of this is individualistic. He's suggesting that this is a community effort. 
he's presupposing that this whole process of discipleship requires other people to be involved. You can't do it on your own, essentially. But that it, does, it does beg the question, uh, why? Right? Uh, verse 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Uh, why can't we do that on our own? It's that three-letter word that should be a four-letter word, sin, right? I mean, that's the short answer. That's the easy answer. Um, in, in 1215, our author makes it clear that we need one another to encourage us, to encourage us to press on, right? And just from a human standpoint, we cannot continue forever without encouragement. We break down. We get tired. Uh, it's just a matter of being in our flesh. We need other people to encourage us to press us on. But that's not the only reason. There's another reason why we can't progress very far on our own. And that is actually found in Jeremiah 17.9 and reiterated in Hebrews 3. Jeremiah 17.9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick who can know it. Secondly, Hebrews 3, 12 through 14, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end." So what's the word that shows up in both of those? Deceive, deceit, right? And as, as you know, this is, this is a, a basic English lesson. <laughs> when you're deceived, you, you don't know it, right? That, I mean, that's, that's what the word means. When you're deceived, you don't know that you're deceived. That's what deceived means. So if our hearts are deceitful, if sin is deceitful, if sin has this power to harden our hearts by its deceitfulness, the clear example from the book of Hebrews is you need someone else who's able to say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, that's, that's not right. You need someone to point out sin in your life because you can't see it clearly. There's a more fundamental reason for this, actually, and that has to do with uh, why we sin. Okay, this one's not rhetorical, but if you had to boil down sin, why you sin, what's behind sin, what would you say? Selfishness, great. Anything else? Okay, pride is the other one that comes up often. And really, selfishness and pride are, are two sides of the same coin, right? Uh, why else would Adam and Eve, for instance, or you, know, you can insert your name if you'd like, why else would we turn away from an infinitely perfect, loving, wise, awesome, holy, great God? Why else would we disobey what he has said? Because uh, we know better, right? <laughs> Because we're selfish, because we're prideful. Either way you look at it, both of them, you're just holding up a mirror to yourself, right? We are what matters the most. <clears throat> so the question then is, can you become selfless on your own? I, I, I'll grant you the Bible and the Spirit, and even regeneration, salvation. And I, I will still ask, can you become selfless on your own? And the answer, of course, is not. I mean, just when you think you've arrived in that model, you will be as far away as, as you were to begin with, right? Uh, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot learn to be selfless 
on your own. You need someone else there to practice on. That's what spouses are for and families. And <laughs> um, it, it's impossible. We can only progress so far. And it, if you think that you are making a lot of progress, then you're in the same condition that James describes, James 1.22. You will be found to only hear the word, only listen to the word and not actually do it, not actually put it into practice. Because that's the part primarily that requires interaction with others. So here's another way to look at it. Fear is self-love if it keeps you from loving others. Fear is self-love, it's selfishness if it keeps you from reaching out to others, if it keeps you from loving others. We are so concerned about protecting ourselves. We're so concerned about not suffering, if at all possible, that we choose to not be involved with other people. We choose to not make meaningful connections with other people because we realize at some point they're going to hurt us or we're going to hurt them and that'll hurt us. And so it's easier to just step away and say, you know what? Nice to meet you, but that's about it. This is not the model of our Lord Jesus Christ. This actually came up in our small group last week. We're going through the book, The, the Passion, and the first chapter is a discussion of Luke chapter 22, uh, verses 39 through 46. And I'll just briefly describe, Christ has come out of the upper room, uh, right where he's just washed the disciples' feet, and they go into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he tells his closest friends, his disciples, he says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then Christ goes, and he prays, and remember, his sweat becomes as like drops of blood, and then he goes back, and what are his disciples doing? They're tired. <laughs> They're sleeping, Right? Uh, obviously letting him down, obviously betraying him. But what, what's important to realize from this little pericope, this little story, is that Christ knew this would happen beforehand. In fact, in verse 34, he had just told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Not, not even to speak of Judas, right, who at this point is off and away, but Christ knew his disciples were going to let him down. He knew it, and yet he still invited them to come along. He still asked them to come with him, knowing that they would be of no help. That is a model for us, to choose to continue to be involved with other people, to choose to go deeper with other people, knowing that it's going to hurt. And it will. I mean, it will. It, that's just the way life is. It will. But if we're concerned about holiness more than we are happiness, we'll do it anyway, just like Christ. Discipleship presupposes being in close relationship with other people. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, right? Our memory verse. I'll just read it. It's okay. <laughs> and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also, right? It presupposes that other people are involved. We, we can't do these things if we're not together. And I'm going uh, to say it straight out. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, uh, He's not talking about Sunday morning. I mean, that's a part of it, but think about it. You have at most, at most, in fact, I'd be surprised if you spend 10 minutes talking with someone this morning. If you do, let me know, because that's amazing, right? Spending 10 minutes talking to someone on a Sunday morning, that's amazing. Uh, that is not what our author has in mind here. There's, there's only so much you can do in 10 minutes on Sunday morning. It's not bad, it's not wrong, right? You should be here on Sunday morning. But what our author is suggesting, what he is requiring, is a whole lot more than just Sunday morning. It's a whole lot more than just Sunday morning. So this leads us then into point number three, 
Uh, verse 24, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, verse 25 goes well with, really well with points two and three, really point one as well. But points two and three, stages one, or I'm sorry, stages two and three to grow in him and to go with him, they require other people. They, they presuppose that other people are involved. And not only that, but if we're doing stage two correctly, if we're doing it well, it's naturally going to lead us into stage three, which is primarily concerned with service. Stage three is primarily concerned with service. Uh, what exactly does he ask here? He says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Which <laughs> prompts the question, when was the last time that you or I sat down and thought about that? You know, when was the last time you thought, how can I motivate this person to do something good? If you're a parent, that doesn't count, because that was this morning, trying to get your kids dressed and whatever else, but <laughs> that's not primarily what he's talking about. Um, but I mean, the question, he's not really even yet to the point of you should be doing these things, but just are you thinking about different ways that you could be doing these things, that you could be encouraging other people to do these things? And not only that, this is one of the let us is, right? <laughs> so it, it means you're doing this in a group with other people, right? When was the last time in a group with other people you were thinking about how can we motivate ourselves, our church, uh, other people in our church to, to love and good works? How can we motivate one another to service? Let's flip back to the book of John. John chapter 13. And this is actually, uh, you know, right before the last example of Jesus that we looked at. John chapter 13, I'm going to start reading in verse 12. When he washed, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Our Lord could not have made his point any clearer than by getting down on his knees and washing the feet. Remember, washing the feet of the 12 that would betray him in just a few hours, right? Judas, completely and utterly, and all the rest are gone right? Christ knows this is going to happen, and what does he do? He gets down on his knees, and he serves them. He gives us an example, and he says that much, in case we were wondering. This is an example that you should do the same thing I'm doing, in case that wasn't clear. Keep in mind that the service is not a means to salvation. It, it's an evidence of it. It's a result of it. That's exactly what James says in 2.18. James 2.18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And James answers, I will show you my faith by my works. Right? There's nevertheless a distinction. You can do a lot of good things on your own for yourself. But if you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you are his child, you will show an evidences of service. You will serve, you will do good works. So this is why you'll note point number three is go with him, right? Not go for him, but go with him because <laughs> lest we allow our selfishness to creep in yet again, uh, God doesn't need you. He does not need you. He doesn't need any of us. He doesn't need any, anything that he created, but he chose 
to create the world. He chose to create us. He chose to create you. And what does Ephesians 2.10 say? Right? He's even created the good works that you and I are to walk in, are to do. So it's the spirit within us that is motivating us to do these things, to serve. And hence, we go with him. We serve alongside of him. We allow the spirit to serve through us. We're not doing it for him. We're going with him. This brings us around to the scripture reading this morning, which was Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which is also on your little brochure handout. Right, we are called to make disciples, not merely converts. There's a huge difference. We're not called to make converts. We're called to make disciples. And, and what does it say? It says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Okay, that is a great definition of a disciple. A disciple is someone who obeys what he has learned from his master or his teacher, right? Simply learning it, it does not make you a disciple. It requires that you obey. That's, that's exactly what Matthew 28 is aimed at. That's what our memory verse is aimed at, 2 Timothy 2. And that's what this passage in Hebrews 10 is talking about as well, is living this out, obeying what we have learned, obeying what we know. We can't quite say that this third stage, to go with him, we can't quite say that it's the most important because they're all essential. But stages one and two definitely culminate in stage three, which is serving. Right? Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are called to serve. So, as we look at what you have here in this brochure, <clears throat> if we look at what, what we're calling our philosophy of ministry, you have some background on, on the side that says philosophy of ministry, and at the bottom of that is, uh, depending on how you look at it, it, it might be bad news or it might be good news, but the last sentence there says, since the ministers of the church are its members, Ephesians 4.12, 1 Peter 2.9, we'll all need to be able to articulate and implement the process. Whoops. In other words, if it's merely the, the elders or the staff that understand this, that care about this, then we will have failed miserably. We will have failed miserably. Because the point is not that a, a handful of people Minister. The point is that the church, the body of Christ, uses the unique talents and gifts that he's given to each of us to minister. So what exactly are we asking then? Well, first of all, we're asking that you take part in knowing what this is all about, right? It would be wonderful if someone walks up to you and says, so how does discipleship happen in your church? I'm guessing you don't get that question very often. But what you might get is, uh, why should I go to church? Or why should I go to your church? Or what makes you unique? Not that we're trying to be unique, but this would be a, a good answer to all of those questions. Well, the first stage is to know him. And in that stage, we focus on the gospel, on theology, on meeting new people, and in the second stage, it's to grow in him. And this is where we move toward greater levels of involvement with other people. And we, we meet together in small groups, and the key components there are relationships, accountability, prayer together, and theology. We're growing together. And then we move into the third stage, which is to go with him. And that's where we serve together. That's where we think up new ways that we can reach out to others. And as a result, when we serve from the kitchen, we bring more people in. More people in to the foyer, more people in to the living room. The, the imagery there is there for your help, right? The first stage is the foyer, when you walk into someone's house, right? It's very good. But if you just stay in the foyer the whole time, it's kind of awkward, right? <laughs> it's the same thing with church, right? Uh, key gatherings, 
our Sunday groups, Sunday school, Sunday morning worship, right here. If all you ever do is come to church every Sunday or whenever you can make it, it's kind of awkward. That's, that's the best description. It's kind of awkward. Uh, it, it's, it's not bad, right? It's just the first step. And there's a lot more steps that you should be taking after that. And the second one is to grow in him. The key gatherings there being small groups, right? Where you can meet with others on a somewhat of a regular basis and have concentrated time with one another so that you can get to know one another well enough so that when I say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that, that's not awkward. It'll always be a little awkward, but uh, you get the point. I, I actually have a relationship with you upon which I can base my judgment of saying, hey, I, I don't think you're doing the right thing there. I think you should reconsider. Uh, how can I help? How can I be of service to you? That won't happen if you're only here on Sunday mornings. And thirdly, to go with him, key gatherings there are service groups. I have to point out the alliteration, right? Sunday groups, small groups, service groups. That's, anyway. Um, it, it'll help you remember it, right? It's a mnemonic device. Uh, there's all sorts of service groups that currently are at work in our church, and there's all sorts more that we have people interested in, that we have people looking to start new ways of, of reaching out. So when it comes down to what exactly are we asking of you, what exactly are we, are we looking at our church for, really it's those three things, right? Be involved in Sunday groups, be involved in some sort of small group, and be involved in some sort of service group. Now note, the genesis for a lot of this was my reading a book by the name of what? Anyone remember? Simple church, right? The point is not to complicate things. The point is not to start a whole bunch of new cool things. Uh, the point is to make it simple. It's not easy, but the point is to make it simple. This is the process. This is, these are the stages that we go through in our church. So that's my encouragement to you from Hebrews chapter 10 this morning and from our uh, nice little brochure to know him, to grow in him, and to go with him. That's what our Lord has asked us to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for each one here. Lord, we, we cannot thank you enough for what you have done in your son, Jesus Christ. The longer we think about it, the longer we read your word to understand what exactly it was, the more awestruck we are. It's unfathomable what you have done, that the creator of the universe would sacrifice himself for us, for his children that have turned away and have run. Lord, we thank you that we can approach your throne with boldness, with confidence, not on the basis of anything we've done, but on the basis of what you've done. Lord, thank you for offering salvation to us. Thank you for offering us the chance to have a restored relationship with you. Lord, we recognize that that is the first step in this process. We must realize that we are hopeless without you and that we need you to rescue us. But it's not the last step. So encourage us this morning to continue to be faithful. Lord, to continue to move towards greater involvement, knowing that it will hurt, knowing that it will cause problems. Encourage us nevertheless to love like you loved, to reach out to others like you reached out to others. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.